Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to uh, more physics lectures. Actually, the final lecture in this uh, course, this series. So, you made it. Good job. Here's the finish line. Well, the last of the lectures. Still got a sort of test thing at the end. Um, but, yeah. Last time we talked about special relativity, right, having to do with things moving really, really fast at a constant speed, though, constant really, really fast speeds, and weird things happening. Length contracting, time dilating, velocities not adding the same way you thought they would anymore, and mentioned a little bit about uh, space-time in that lecture, and how all those sorts of things how movement was affecting time and um, yeah, basically how movement and time, so changing how you were in space was affecting how time was uh, evolving and kind of leading us to the idea that, yeah, that actually space and time are not separate things. So this lecture we're going to get more into that and what are the consequences of that. So there we go, done relatively. Okay, so uh, just like last lecture, this lecture is still going to rely a good bit on imagining yourselves in different situations. So in different, particularly in different frames of reference. So remember a frame of reference is just a um, sort of like a perspective. It's a place where you observe things happening and that place is itself at rest. So like my outlook, my way of view of the world, that's my frame of reference. I'm always at rest in my own frame, and I observe other things moving at different rates around me. Okay, and last um, lecture was all with what we called inertial frames. Like I mentioned, those are frames that are moving at constant speeds. So not speeding up, not slowing down, just moving at the same rate, at the same speed, or at rest. In this lecture, we need to talk about non-inertial reference frames. So, comparatively, if you think about um, two inertial frames, right, so one where you're at rest and one where you're moving at a constant speed. And I mentioned about this last time, in that essentially you can't really, if you're in like sort of an enclosed chamber, not like a car or anything like this, but imagine you're in say like a, a spaceship and there's nothing, there's no windows to look out, it's entirely closed, you wouldn't be able to tell if you, that spaceship was just at rest, just kind of hovering in space, or if it was actually moving along at a constant speed, like who knows, hundreds of thousands of miles an hour, I don't know what it would be, right? But as long as it's at a constant speed, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that and being at rest. Okay? And you could probably imagine this, or you might have noticed this at times when you're driving, say, down the highway, and you might be, or somebody else is driving, it's easier to notice when you're not the one driving, maybe even, but the car is moving at like 60 miles an hour, maybe, right? Constant, steady 60 miles an hour. And as long as the ride is smooth, it's not super bumpy or anything, there can be at times when you easily mistake the fact that you're actually not, or it seems like maybe you're not moving at all, right? You could, you might as well be at rest, you know? And things like, you know, tossing balls up in the air and then coming right back down to you just like you were at rest is an indication that the, that's true. So it turns out that, yeah, in a rest frame or a frame moving at a constant rate, there's no real way to tell the difference, um, assuming you're just in like an enclosed sort of uh, frame. You can't really see outside of it. So those are both inertial frames. Now, like I said, we want to think about accelerated reference frames or non-inertial reference frames. So when you're in a non-inertial frame, it's actually very easy to tell that your uh, reference frame is accelerating. So like the picture here, the push, when you are in a car and you speed up, you get pushed into the back of the seat. Or when you slow down, you brake, you get kind of pushed forward a little bit. You feel that pull going forward a little bit. So when you're actually in a frame that is accelerating, it's actually pretty easy to tell. Okay, 
So, now let's try to imagine a couple of situations. So you want to, again, imagine yourself in a frame of reference that's essentially in an enclosed spaceship. Right? Like here, you see, you were seeing into the spaceship, but we want to imagine that the spaceship is actually totally sealed and you can't see into it and the person can't see out of it. So again, if that spaceship is at rest, just hovering around, or at a, uh, moving at a constant speed, there'd be no way to tell between those two, essentially. There's, you'd just be floating regardless, either way. As long as you're in the spaceship, you're far away from any, gra any planets, any stars, far away from any gravitational fields. So the only thing that can tell you is whether or not you're moving or not is how you sort of a, your motion is affected. Right? And there's no difference between being at rest or, being, or moving at a constant speed. So in either of those frames, either of those instances, you'd just be floating. Now contrast that with being in that spaceship and suddenly the rockets turn on and fire and start moving you, accelerating you in a direction. Again, in that case, it's really easy to tell that your frame of reference is accelerating because you'd be pushed down to the floor. Right? As the uh, spaceship moves up into you, it kind of is uh, uh, yeah, just pushing you down and everything else down onto the floor. And as it turns out, um, just as uh, gravity, we talked about gravity a while ago, but gravity is a force due to the mass of the Earth. So the fact that the Earth is massive, it creates a gravitational field. That gravitational field exerts a gravitational force on you. And the effect of that force is to accelerate you downward. It's to try to, well, not accelerate right now because I'm standing on the floor, but if I jumped off of a uh, ledge, uh, jumped out of an airplane, gravity, or you drop something, gravity is accelerating that object at about 10 meters per second per second. Right? So it's getting, making it speed up faster and faster every second. All that said, if the spaceship you were in was actually accelerating at 10 meters per second per second, then essentially it would be just like you were standing in Earth's gravitational field, or this, on the surface of the Earth. Be more exact. So whether you're accelerate in an accelerating reference frame or whether you're there in a gravitational frame, kind of hard to tell the difference. Right? You basically the effects are the same. So even for instance, if you were to drop uh, balls, right, do all of whatever experiments you want to do. Um, like figure out how fast the things are accelerating and uh, the same sort of stuff that Galileo was doing back to figuring out how objects move in gravitational fields. All of those kinds of things you could do in a gravitational field or like on the Earth's surface in Earth's gravitational field, if you do them in a rocket ship that's accelerating at 10 meters per second per second, then you're going to get the same results as you would as if, if you were doing those experiments on the surface of the Earth. So, right, that kind of brings us to the conclusion that if you were in an enclosed spaceship, it's actually impossible to tell whether you're in like a normal Newtonian gravitational field, that sort of gravitational field we've been talking about, or we've talked about before, or whether that ship was accelerating in empty space. No, not near any gravitational uh, or any masses, not in any gravitational fields, but just accelerating at the right rate to mimic essentially that gravitational force, that acceleration from gravity. And it turns out this is one of, if not the main uh, principle behind uh, general relativity. And that's known as the principle of equivalence, which essentially just says that same thing. It says whether you're in an accelerated reference frame or in a gravitational field, there's no way to tell the difference. As long as the acceleration, the amount of acceleration is the same. Good. So your spaceship could accelerate at different rates and then it wouldn't feel like you're in Earth's gravitational field. If it was accelerating faster, you'd feel like you're in a stronger gravitational field, maybe like uh, Jupiter's gravitational field or something. If you're accelerating slower, you feel like maybe you're on the moon's in the moon's gravitational field. But yeah. 
So whether you're in a specific gravitational field or whether you're just in an accelerated reference frame, assuming that you can't see anything outside of this like spaceship, there's no way to tell the difference. Okay. So this is another kind of thought experiment thing and it's going to lead us to some interesting consequences in uh, general relativity. So I want to imagine that there's again a spaceship and that spaceship can uh, either be flying upwards very quickly or even be accelerating upwards very quickly depending on the situation. And what we're going to do is imagine you take a, a light of some sort of laser or whatever you want to think about it and you shine that light into the side of the spaceship as it's moving along. So in this top portion here, we're just imagining uh, this happening with inertial frames of reference. Right? So uh, the spaceship is moving at a constant speed. And from on the left hand side there, this is the perspective of an outside observer. So someone who's in a reference frame outside of the spaceship and sort of at rest with respect to the spaceship moving along. So you're on the ground, you're watching this light move through the spaceship, and what do you see? Well, from the outside perspective, all you're doing, it's just like looking at a laser, right? A laser just goes boom, straight across. However, since the spaceship is moving, right, before the light hits the far side, the spaceship will have moved up, and so the light will actually strike the inside of the spaceship below where it entered in, right? It's going to enter up here, or it's going to enter like this, and the spaceship moves along, so it hits down below where it came in. Okay, cool. Wait. You watched it, it follows a straight horizontal line. Now you would imagine yourself inside that spaceship, still spaceship moving at a constant speed, still in an inertial reference frame, but if you're inside of that spaceship, this you're at rest you and the spaceship are the same reference frame, essentially, so you and the spaceship are at rest, right? And what it, you would actually see is that light, when it came in, it would look like it was coming down at an angle, right? So since you're at rest, you actually see the light sort of, it seems like it goes at, uh, like it came in at an angle, and it still hits down below, just where it hit in the outside observer's reference frame. Right, so both inertial reference frames, both paths for light are just are straight lines. They may not be the exact same straight line. You see it a little bit differently, but these are both straight lines. They agree that the light came in. They agree that the light hit down there. Okay. So now that we're talking about accelerated reference frames, about non-inertial reference frames, we want to imagine that this spaceship isn't going at a constant speed now. It's accelerating upward. And if you think about it, the outside observer still sees the same thing. It doesn't change the outside perspective. When you're watching this uh, spaceship go by, it accelerates upward, and the person watching from the outside just sees the light go straight across again, right? All they're seeing is the light start here, go straight across. It just turns out that for the accelerated one now, the inside observer is gonna be a bit different. So if you're inside of that spaceship, the light comes in, but unlike in the inertial frame, you're not moving up the same distance every time, so light doesn't go, you're not seeing it move kind of down at this constant angle, right? So instead of coming down at this diagonal, along this diagonal line, what you would see in your reference frame inside the spaceship, since you're moving up more and more every second, you're accelerating, then you'd actually see the light move down more and more every second as well. So as you move up along, you see the light and it looks like the light is bending downwards, not following a straight path anymore. So in that accelerated reference frame, the light, the light bent. Right? It didn't follow a straight path anymore. Now, going back just to the slide back before that, or thinking back to just a second ago, the principle of equivalence says that uh, being an accelerated reference frame and being in a gravitational reference frame, or the reference frame that's in a gravitational field, you can't tell the difference. Okay? There's no way to distinguish between those. So, what that means is if light bends in an accelerate going through an accelerated reference frame, light will also bend going through a gravitational field. And you might say, how is that? 
gravity was supposed to just affect mass, right? If some two things are massive, then they'd have a gravitational effect on each other, or pull on each other, right? So the answer, or a simplified sort of version of the answer, maybe one that's a bit easier to understand, is, yeah, light doesn't have mass. A there's no mass to a photon, but it does have energy. And in the last lecture, we, well, one of the last things I told you about was that famous equation saying how energy and mass are related. They're actually equivalent things. If you have mass, there is mass, there's a certain amount of energy associated with that. If there is just energy, there's a certain actually amount of mass you could think being associated with that. So the simple answer is essentially that gravity pulls on sort of the energy of light. And because energy and mass are equivalent, gravity can do that. So that's the simplified sort of answer. So um, this was actually, uh, or this idea was used to predict one of the first uh, sort of tests of general relativity, or make a prediction for what general relativity would tell you and see if that's actually true. Um, and that test was essentially that when you have uh, light from a star that's far away from us, outside of our solar system, well, no other stars besides our sun in their solar system, but stars outside of our solar system. And if the star is uh, sort of near, uh, like behind the sun, it's kind of being eclipsed by the sun, so it, uh, the sun's in between us and that distant star. The sun, our sun is very large, has a very large amount of mass, and so it actually warps the space uh, around it. Oh, I, we'll get to that in a second. It has a very large gravitational field, which means, like we just said, it's going to bend light. And so if that star is kind of behind or very near the corner of the edge of this uh, sun, that light bends. It doesn't bend a lot, because even though how big the sun is, it's not a whole lot of uh, effect there. But it will bend the light of it a little bit. Right? And so just like when we were looking at lenses, you have that light bends around the sun. And so we see the light coming straight at us. Our understanding is to project that light straight back and so we'd actually see the star being a little bit further out to the side than it should be or than it actually is so even though the star's here the light bends we project that back and it's right there it turns out doing these observations and doing them usually during a solar eclipse so you can just see the stuff right around the sun is exactly what general relativity predicts right? we have some pictures here where uh, we know where stars normally are, or they're going to be. You can map the, uh, you know, map the stars in the sky, and then right when they're coming back around or near the edge of the sun, you can see. Well, this is the normal in this picture. The yellow, yellow dots. That's where the stars should be. That's where we know they should be. But due to that uh, bending of light, we actually see the stars a little bit further away from the sun. So this is one of the first kinds of observations to confirm this prediction of general relativity. I'm going to go much more into this idea too. Okay, so what's uh, going on? Think about it a little bit more. Um, it requires us to go back to this idea of space-time, or to revisit this and uh, make it a little bit more detailed. Kind of get into it a little bit. Okay. So uh, space-time is a term that we use for the combined properties, the combined things of space and time. So before, for a long time in our history, it was basically thought that space was one thing and it was static. Or there were people who debated one way or another. But Newton, for instance, was a big proponent of this static space. Right? You have space, it's one thing, it's there. There's no, there's nothing to do about it, right? A meter is here, a meter is there, a meter is there, and nothing to do with time. Time is just a way of watching uh, events evolve, or kind of categorizing how events evolve. Right? So you got space and time is just a way of counting things. But general relativity and Einstein, or, well, Einstein was the biggest, it's the biggest name known in all this special relativity, general relativity. He's not the only person who did things here, but he did a lot, so he gets a lot of credit, which he should. 
So his idea is essentially that space and time are not different things, they're actually one and the same, they're part of the same four-dimensional thing, so space is three-dimensional, you add one more dimension, you get time in there, and we have this four-dimensional sort of fabric that makes up the universe. And now, the space is not separate from time, you have space and time, and those things are not uh, static, they're mutable, right? They can change, they can be bent, particularly, and stretched. Okay. So, mass, Anything that is massive, myself, you, this camera, the floor, the earth, the sun, all those things stretch the fabric of space-time. And it's essentially the deforming of that uh, fabric that we experience as gravity. And, well, the more massive an object is, the more it's going to stretch space-time. So in, just like in the last lecture, when I was saying stuff about, you know, moving at a certain speed, I mean, you had to just kind of imagine moving at really, really fast speeds. Um, and a lot of this sort of stuff, the effects of general relativity aren't that large unless you're talking about very large masses right? or very large accelerations. So for the most part, if I say a massive object, I'm meaning, yeah, technically you are a massive object, but you're not going to stretch space time that much. You have a very small sort of effect on the fabric of space time, but a tiny bit. It's like an ant moving along on a stretched surface. There is some tiny bending there, but it's almost imperceptible. The Earth, however, does some bending. The Sun is even more massive, it does more bending. The our galaxy is even more massive. It kind of has its own sort of thing. Um, and we'll talk about other objects that are even more massive and bend stuff even more, or bend space space time even more. Um, so yeah, so we have this four-dimensional fabric, and it's sort of easier to think about it or to imagine it as a two-dimensional surface, and you put something on that surface and it bends that surface, it stretches it down, and the bigger thing you put on, the more it stretches it. We have to also remember, though, that it is a four-dimensional thing, and technically it's a closer to imagine this sort of uh, three-dimensional grid and that grid being stretched uh, sort of in whenever there's a big mass. But for the most part, you just think about it as a flat surface. And let's see some videos that might make that a little bit more uh, visual. So before I start this, uh, here's this guy, and he's got this nice little setup where he has a fabric that he's laid over this uh, kind of uh, tabletop thing here. And on the fabric, he's actually projecting a uh, grid. Right? And so the grid is a nice way to think about uh, this grid on the fabric. It's a nice way to think about space time, because when you project that grid onto a flat surface like this, like this fabric now, you get a nice even grid. Right? So this is like space time where there's no mass. Right? Everything's uh, very evenly uh, separated space and time are sort of in even intervals. And so what he's showing there is basically that on that flat space time, if you have an object that's moving through it, it's just going to roll on a straight line. It just moves in a straight line. And there's also this overhead picture, which is probably not easy to see on this video, but again, I encourage you to go check out the other, the links to the other, these videos in the uh, description here. Um, but yeah, the grid's nice and even, the ball just rolls straight along. And this overhead view gives you even a, well, I don't need to talk about that. Let me keep, let's keep going. So now he's gonna put on big mass. Right. So instead of just having this flat surface, this flat fabric there, you put a big object, a massive object, into that and it stretches the fabric down. Right. And you can even see the stretching because he's projecting the grid on there, you can see how much the, that grid is stretched. So now that space-time is not in even intervals around there, it stretches in different ways.
And he's saying some other stuff there too, but we don't want to get too much into it. So yeah, what we see now though, with that object, that massive object in there and it's stretched space time, if you roll an object, another object along that space time, instead of moving in that straight path, it actually tends to go and move in this circular or elliptical paths. And we start to actually see something that looks sort of like the sun and planets orbiting around. So that's basically what it's, what it, or one sort of example of trying to understand that space and time are one thing, mass stretches space and time, and it's those, that stretching, that deformation of space time that causes what we experience as gravity. So it's just that stretching that causes, say, like the planets to go around the sun. It's, just, it's actually the same effect is what is keeping me on the Earth as sort of spinning around here. All right. So jump to the side real quick. Uh, it makes should maybe already make sense why we're talking about this, but if it doesn't, it'll make sense more in the next slide. Okay. So how do we find the shortest distance between two points? Well, if that those two points are on a flat surface, hopefully you know the shortest distance between those two points is a straight line. Right? Draw a line straight from one point to the other, that's the shortest possible distance between those two points. However, if that surface is not flat, the shortest distance is not going to be a straight line anymore. And we can see this, you probably experienced this if you've taken long plane flights, where if you imagine, well, just on a long plane flight, but one example is if you're trying to go from Philadelphia to Beijing, right? Halfway around the world. If you imagine, or if you think of uh, the Earth as just being a flat surface, it would make much more sense that the shortest distance between those two points, Philadelphia and Beijing, is just to go um, straight west. Right? Take off, go straight west until you hit Beijing. There you go, straight line. The Earth is not a flat surface, it is spherical, and so the shortest distance between those two points is on, if you draw it on that flat surface, it doesn't, it doesn't look right, it looks weird. But the point is that if you look at it on this uh, spherical surface that it is, it actually makes a lot more sense why you would go in this arc over sort of near the um, uh, North Pole instead of trying to go around closer to the equator. The technical term for this sort of arc is actually a, a great circle. It's a circle that goes around, or a circle that uh, passes through the center, sort of, or cuts through the center of the Earth. Okay, so the shortest path between two points, not always a straight line. And this is partly another way to understand why uh, light will bend when it goes around near very massive objects in space-time, right? Because those, that massive object is bending the space, their space-time, around it. And so light normally to get from one point to another, it's going to take the shortest path. Well, it's always going to take the shortest possible path between two points. Right? So you have light coming from that far star coming to Earth. Right? If the space was flat, you would just draw a straight line from that point A to the Earth, and it would actually be intercepted by the sun. You wouldn't see that star. Right? The light trying to come uh, straight to Earth, it would just get blocked by the sun. However, since the space is curved, the shortest path between that point, that star at A, and the Earth is not a straight line, it's a line that bends like this and comes around the Sun. And then again, we sort of just project back to where we think that star would have been then if we go straight back. And that's why we see the star, uh, when they're just near the edge of the Sun, we see them moved out a little bit away from where they actually are. So light does take the shortest path between two points, but the shortest path is not always a straight line. So this has some pretty interesting uh, effects. 
especially on a very large uh, cosmic scale. Um, essentially, that the fact that uh, light is going to bend because it's taking the shortest path between uh, two points in a curved space-time means that we get, or when we look out of the cosmos, we actually sometimes see a sort of lens-like effect, this dis like distorted uh, lens kind of uh, effect. Right? And it's similar to uh, the distortion you get like in a fisheye lens. Right? In a fisheye, uh, part of that the image is usually nice, and uh, it looks right, the proportions are correct, but as you get towards the edge of that lens, you get these uh, distortions and things start to bend a lot. So when you have uh, large clusters of mass, something is very massive, like a huge star, or many stars together, and you kind of have a, gl a cluster of things that are all very massive, and together they make up a huge mass, then we get uh, this gravitational lensing effect, and that is this distortion of the, uh, the light that's coming from sort of behind that massive object. So the light's trying to come from behind there and come to Earth, but again, the shortest path between those two points is not straight anymore. Since the space is curved in between it, it actually curves around. And so we get this cool, these cool sorts of images where um, in C here, there's a this galaxy, I think it's a galaxy, right in the middle of the image, and then there's another galaxy that behind the, that one, but the light from it is being distorted so much that it almost makes it look like it's a ring around this galaxy, around the one in front of us, or the one in the foreground. So that bent one is just behind the other galaxy, and the light is being bent around this one in the foreground. Um, so this is, I guess it's called an Einstein ring, actually. And finally, in D here, we have a picture where um, you actually can see a lot of this gravitational lensing. There's a lot of these uh, galaxies that should be a little bit more, should be more rounded, but they actually kind of look like they've been stretched out, right? And they're stretching out all around in this sort of spherical almost region. Right? But in this picture, in that image, there's no apparent thing that's going to be causing that gravitational lensing, right? There need to be a whole lot of mass in the foreground, kind of in front of us, between us and those galaxies, to cause that lensing to happen. In C, it's a lot more obvious that, yeah, there's a galaxy there. D, nothing apparently there. So this is actually evidence for dark matter, for the fact that there is mass in the universe that we don't see except by the fact that it affects things gravitationally. Right? So there is stuff there the only way we can tell is because it has mass, and that mass distorts space-time just like any other mass. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot. We're not going to have time to talk more about dark matter or dark energy. But there you go. There's a little bit. All right. So let's have a quick question here. So you learned previously that the pull of gravity is an interaction between masses. Masses attract each other. Uh, and we have learned that the light has no mass. Maybe I didn't make as much of a point of that, but like a photon, there's no mass to a photon. And now we say that light can be bent by gravity. Isn't this a contradiction? So go ahead and pause and try to answer, or come up with an answer, and we'll see what you got. Right, so hopefully you said no, this is not a contradiction. Why it's not? Well, it goes back to the idea, uh, the principle from uh, special relativity that is, says mass and energy are equivalent. If you have a certain amount of mass, that means it's equivalent to having a certain amount of energy. If a certain amount of energy means it's equivalent to having a certain amount of mass. So light, even though, or a photon, or doesn't have mass, it has energy, and gravity pulls on that energy. Okay, so a little bit more about what gravity will do. So, remember from special relativity, we found out that, no, that space and time are not separate things, they're part of one and the same thing, space-time. And 
as I've been telling you about, massive objects, meaning any object with mass, and again, technically, it takes a lot of mass to do much of it, have much of an effect, but any mass actually does do this, that massive objects stretch space-time. So if you're stretching space-time, essentially that's saying that uh, time is going to be, it's going to go slower, right? The ticks are going to be longer and longer. You're stretching out space-time when you're in a very strong gravitational field. Okay? And the stronger the gravitational field, the slower that time will uh, seem to tick. And that's relative to being in a weaker gravitational field or outside of gravitational field. Yep. All right. So how about another question? So who would age slower? A person who's living at the top of a skyscraper or a person in the basement of that skyscraper? So once again, go ahead and pause and give an answer. I'll think about it why it might be. All right. So hopefully you said the person in the basement is actually going to age slower. Why is that? Well, like I just told you, time is going to go slower the, uh, in a stronger gravitational field. And um, ho hopefully you remember that Earth's gravitational field is not a constant thing. Like we said, Earth's gravitational field uh, acts as a force on other masses and accelerates you at about 10 meters per second per second, right? But that's just on the Earth's surface. And we also told you, or I also told you a while ago that the gravitational force uh, falls off or gets weaker as you get further and further away from the mass that's causing it, in this case, the Earth. So the further and further you are away from the center of the Earth, the weaker the gravitational for, uh, field is, uh, the further weaker the, yeah, the gravitational field is getting weaker as you move further away. And technically it falls off as that inverse square, um, thing, but we don't have to keep talk, go back and talk about that so much. So yeah, so the person in the basement is closer to the uh, center of the earth, it's closer to the mass, um, and so it's in a stronger gravitational field, so time will run slower for that person as compared to the person in the skyscraper. So technically, the person in the basement would live a little bit longer. But don't get too excited about this. As I said, it takes a very large amount of mass to really make much of a noticeable effect. And it turns out that even if you know, were a person and you lived at the top of a skyscraper your whole life and a person at the basement of a the skyscraper their whole life, it would only amount to the diff a difference of, what is that, a few billionths of a second. So you wouldn't even notice. But that would be different if you said, you know, a person who's going to live very, very close to uh, the sun or a star that's much more massive than the sun versus somebody that's living far out in space where there's no real gravitational force. In that case, the difference would be much more pronounced. Just depends on how big a difference you are talking about in terms of a very strong gravitational field or a weak gravitational field. Okay, so. We're going to keep going and just going to look at some other predictions of general relativity and how they sort of came uh, to show us that, yeah, general relativity is correct. This idea that space and time are, space time is warped by uh, massive objects. That has all kinds of repercussions. So, um, the motion of Mercury for one. Okay. So, as it turns out, uh, planets, when they're orbiting uh, the sun, right, they generally they're orbiting in ellipses, right? So ellipses are kind of oblong, and the sun sits at one of the foci of the ellipse. Right? And as it turns out, the planets don't continually orbit in the same uh, sort of motion entirely. So where uh, the uh, planet comes closest to the sun, I believe that's called the perihelion, that point can actually uh, advance uh, over time, right? So instead of the ellipse maybe being kind of in this direction, 
eventually, over time, the whole ellipse sort of starts to move along and advances. And that is called the precession, actually. So that closest point to the sun actually sort of steadily moves around. And uh, this precession is most pronounced in Mercury, Mercury being the closest planet to the sun, so it's in a very strong uh, gravitational field. Um, and it turns out that a large part of this precession, or why this is happening, can actually be explained through just gravitational, or Newton, Newtonian gravitation, or Newton's idea of gravity. And that is essentially that the, uh, the thing is evolving around, it's rotating around the sun because of the sun's mass, but it's actually that whole thing is evolving too because there's other planets around and other things around that are massive that are actually kind of perturbing that situation. So it's not just the planet of the sun, it's the other planets too, and that effect it, um, amounts to uh, advancing this uh, ellipse along. But Newtonian gravity, or gravity couldn't predict entirely. It was actually a little bit short, or couldn't understand why the Mercury processed as quickly as it did. And it turns out that with general relativity, you sort of add this correction factor to Newtonian gravity, and you can fully predict and account for the precession of Mercury. So score one for another one for general relativity. Okay, so another interesting thing that comes out of uh, general relativity and our understanding of space-time is something you've probably heard of, uh, black holes and mysterious objects. It can be very confusing, but on one level, or a certain level, it's pretty straightforward, actually. So, like I told you, and like we saw in some of those visualizations, uh, massive objects will kind of warp, uh, stretch the fabric of space-time. And the more massive an object is, the more stretching you get. So in that diagram on the bottom left, you have a certain, like our sun, you put in space-time, it sort of causes this one, this certain amount of stretching to happen. You have replaced that with an even more massive object, you get more stretching. Replace with an even more massive object, you get even more stretching. If you replace it with enough mass confined into a small enough space, sort of, it, 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 in effect, it's the density of the object that's really important. So you have enough mass that's confined to a small enough space that it's going to stretch the fabric of space time so much that it basically breaks it. It stretches it to its breaking point and there you go, you essentially have a hole in space-time. And that stretching is so much that essentially, like, you know, when, you're, when you stretch down the fabric, the, the sides of that fabric, or that uh, kind of divot, get steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper as you're stretching it, right? And a black hole is essentially the, also could be thought of as the point where you've stretched the fabric so much that the, uh, the slopes on either side are essentially vertical, and they're so steep that no object can climb back out of them. So if something comes into that sort of region of space-time with the black hole, it's going to, uh, and it falls, it comes into there, there's no way it can get back out. So this is actually, on the right is actually an image, the first image we have of a black hole, and that was only from last year that this image came out. Um, and essentially what you're seeing in the image is the bright, uh, kind of ring is uh, is matter and different uh, particles and whatnot and gas and dust and things that are being that are in the gravitational pull of the um, black hole and just like planets go around stars they're just whirling around the uh, black hole and eventually probably gonna get sucked all the way in but they're sort of um, circling around outside of that area where gravity's where the space is so steep that they can't get back out yet. So once they get past that point, then not even light comes back out of there, that's where you get that black uh, shadow kind of spot in the middle, right? Anything that goes that close into the black hole goes all the way back in and we get nothing that can come back out. So that's why it's just black. And, oh yeah, we have a little video for this. So here, the same kind of uh, picture, it's just now, instead of having uh, that fabric and just being stretched more and more and more, you now uh, have this situation where that stretch, that fabric's been stretched so much that there's just a hole at the bottom. Right? So when you let something go, 
in this situation, it's going to circle around just like it did when there was a mass in there. And when it gets closer, it circles faster and faster and faster and faster. And eventually, I don't even know if it does in this video, but just like if you were putting a coin in one of those little uh, toy things like this, you'd see that the, uh, the object is going to start rolling around and rolling faster and faster and faster and faster. And it, once it gets past this point of no return, it falls in and it's never going to come back out. Technically, that point, that edge that it crosses, is what's known as the event horizon of the black hole. So a little bit more about black holes. Um, right, so the amount of mass that you need to have a black hole, again, like I said before, it depends on how concentrated that mass is. So really it's the density of matter, of mass, that makes sense. You can find enough a mass to a small enough space, you can create a black hole. Um, typically though, black holes are, the amount of mass in a black hole is very large and so large that we generally classify them as being, you know, how many times the sun's mass is that black hole. And so you have something like maybe 10 times the mass of our sun is, could be the mass of a black hole. Or even enormous black holes, 7 billion times the mass of our sun. 7 billion suns is the mass in a black hole. You get to that sort of region and we're now talking about not just regular black holes, these are so massive that we give them that sort of superlative term of supermassive. We now have a supermassive black hole. It's this enormously massive object. Um, and interestingly enough, we have found over time that it seems that there are supermassive black holes at the center of pretty much all large galaxies, including our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So it's possible that these supermassive black holes actually have a part that they play in the evolution of galaxies and galaxies forming, but that's sort of, sort of undetermined currently. Um, and so the image in the bottom left is actually of the uh, Milky Way. Uh, it looks like it's somewhere in Utah or something. But if you see the Milky Way and you look near uh, the constellation uh, Sagittarius, Sagittarius uh, sort of looks like a tea kettle, teapot. Um, the center of the Milky Way galaxy is actually a little bit above the spout of the teapot. So you look at that uh, Sagittarius there, up and to the, to the right and up a bit, that's about where the center of the Milky Way galaxy is, and it turns out there is a supermassive black hole right there. And this is just a chart, so for some classifications. There's not really a hard and fast classifications of uh, what makes us something a uh, micro black hole, a stellar black hole, intermediate. These are they're sort of rough areas. But essentially once you get to the point where you're uh, tens of thousands to billions or so uh, times the mass of our sun, then we're talking about supermassive black holes. It's also interesting to note how small black holes can be too. Like you have this sort of scale of micro black holes and that can be like the mass of the sun confined within a region, you know, 0.1 millimeter. Right? Tiny little place, the whole mass of our sun condensed right into there. Okay, so finally one more interesting thing about general relativity outcome uh, is that since space and time are one thing, space time, and like I've been saying, massive objects will warp space time. And so if you put a massive object on a piece of fabric, it stretches it, just it warps it. Um, but in space, uh, or generally, things aren't just like kind of sitting still in space, they're sort of moving through space in one way or another, right? Like the Earth's revolving around the Sun, the Sun's revolving around the center of the galaxy. And just like, or similar to like if, uh, you know, you have a boat resting on the surface of the water and the boat starts moving, that boat's going to create waves behind it, or push, kind of create waves to move away from it. So in the same sort of way, massive objects when they're moving through space-time are actually creating gravitational waves. 
And it turns out when you have two massive objects that uh, sort of collide and merge, um, you can create sort of like a burst of gravitational waves. And we'll see a visualization of that in a second. Um, the thing is that, uh, as I mentioned multiple times before, uh, the gravitational force is, is incredibly weak. So what that really means is that the waves that are created are very, in a sense, very weak, and they're very hard to detect. So people were looking for them for quite a while, and we actually finally detected some in first time in 2015. There's been a few other detections since then. And the, that event that caused gravitational waves large enough for us to be able to sort of detect uh, was actually the merging of two black holes. So two black holes, like the image here, imagine each one of these is a black hole, and it's a visualization because you wouldn't be able to see the black hole. Right? It's not, you wouldn't be able to see that tannish or turquoise color. But uh, the black holes are circling each other, and then eventually they uh, kind of slowly uh, close in on each other, and finally they're going to merge, and we get this burst of gravitational waves. All right. So in the picture here, you got the little black dots. These are the black holes. The color is essentially how much warp or how warped is space time there. So space time is very warped right below these black holes to the point where it's broken, essentially ripped space time. And as these black holes are sort of circling each other, they're going to be getting closer and closer and closer. And we'll just watch this, watch this out. And finally, they slow it down even more at this uh, time. This is like milliseconds uh, ticking along here. And right as they get into each other, they merge, and you get this sort of burst of gravitational energy, and you get a, a burst of gravitational waves getting shot out, right? So the two have merged, and black holes have merged to become one and we get this burst of gravitational waves that are shot out, spread out from that area. And keep in mind, again, we're visualizing space-time as like a two-dimensional sort of uh, surface here that gets stretched, but really this is three-dimensional. So it's not like these gravitational waves are just moving out on a plane. The gravitational waves move out in this sort of spherical way in all directions. All right, we're almost done here. One of the last things you might want to worry about, or maybe I've kind of eased your mind about it a little as we've gone on here, is getting back to this correspondence principle. And remember, the correspondence principle essentially says that wherever you have a new sort of theory or a new way of understanding something, it should agree with the old way when we know the old way was correct. So essentially, in places where Newtonian gravity works just fine, like me standing on the Earth or dropping uh, an apple, right? Newtonian gravity predicts that motion just fine. So we need it to be the case that if we were to use uh, general relativity, the theory of general rel relativity, it should predict the same thing that Newton said in that event. Right? When Newton was correct, general relativity should agree. So how is that the case here? Well. In terms of, well, the theory of relativity overall, we talked, or I talked about special relativity last time, but essentially, relativity just deals with very large quantities of things. So, not just quantities, very large quality of uh, things. So, to, for instance, if you were dealing with very large amounts of mass or very large uh, accelerations, things accelerating very quickly, and very large amounts of mass being like the mass of the sun, or 10 times the mass of the sun, or a billion times the mass of the sun, right? We need to talk about huge masses. Only in those cases do you really need general relativity. Because like I've tried to point out, the effects of general relativity are, on our scale, are incredibly small. We don't even perceive them. Because you're not, there's not enough mass involved to really have any noticeable effect. 
And essentially the correspondence is that general relativity, when you're talking about things that are not very massive, essentially just says the same thing that New Newtonian gravity did. So we do have this correspondence. And then it, just to remind you that in special relativity, you're essentially dealing with very large speeds, relative speeds of things moving around. Right? And when you have very large speeds, special relativity comes into place. And very large, again, meaning something like at least like 10% the speed of light, but more like half the speed of light. So like, I forget, I think it was like 300 million miles per hour, something like that. Then you have to start dealing with general special relativity. But before that, special relativity, that uh, sort of Lorentz factor that I had mentioned last time, um, that tells you how much you have to worry about special relativity, it's just one. Um, and which essentially means you don't need to worry about special relativity, it's gonna give you the same results that we had before. Yeah. So yeah, even in terms of uh, calculating things like the motion of the planets, space probes, um, missions to the moon, missions to things like that, that you might think are, you know, maybe large accelerations or I don't know. But essentially, you join gravity or your Newton's theories of gravity work just fine there still. They don't even need general relativity there. It's only in cases where we're talking about like the precession of mercury, like I told you about, or uh, the physics of black holes, or when we're talking about uh, the behavior of subatomic particles, because subatomic particles are so light that they're often moving at very high speeds, so you have to uh, account for special relativity. So only in those sort of cases, Newtonian physics doesn't work anymore, and we need Einstein's answers. We need general relativity, we need special relativity. And again, it wasn't just Einstein. I kind of tried to stay away from name dropping too many people. Um, the reason my thought process is that these people sh deserve the recognition for sure, but there are also many other people who are involved too, right? Like if you're talking about special relativity, I can also tell you about Lorentz and Hilbert and Poincaré and like, there's a lot of other people there, but Einstein mostly gets name dropped about it. So if you want to know more about it, then great, go for a history sort of lesson here. Um, I'm trying to focus more on the physics than the people, even though the people do deserve credit, just because they can't be distracting. And there's too many people to credit. All right, so that is all I have to tell you about general relativity. And beyond that, that's all I have to tell you about physics. So, made it to the end of the course. Congratulations, well done. Glad you stuck with it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and well, I hope you learned some stuff. So, to kind of wrap up, I wanted to come maybe kind of full circle here. So, we started out the course in a much different way than we're doing it right now and it's not the greatest but it is what it is so um, going all the way back to the first lecture I talked a little bit about uh, science and the scientific method and what it was about this idea and then physics a little bit more in particular relate as being sort of this fundamental uh, science but I want to come back around to that right so um, this scientific attitude, the attitude you should have as a scientist is, again, it's one of inquiry, questioning, it's experimentation, where you want to uh, test things and find out, and a willingness to admit error. If you think something's one way and it turns out it's not, you better be willing to accept that. All right? So that's the at, sort of the attitude of science. But beyond that, there's really a main driving force to science, to what caused us to develop this scientific method. And from, for me at least, that is curiosity. It all starts with this inquiry. So curiosity, like, why are things the way they are? It's sort of this, if you've ever dealt with a, a toddler or a young child, um, or you can remember being one yourself, 
then you probably remember this very frustrating, can be frustrating line of questioning where a child just does not stop asking why. Right? They ask you a question, you tell them, explain to them, you know, what you think is going to be satisfactory, and they again keep digging why, 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 why. Right? And <laughs> as annoying as that can be sometimes, um, in my opinion, that feeling, that curiosity, that desire to dig deeper and deeper, keep asking why, is a bedrock of scientific exploration. That's what drives science. So my other thing is usually I realize that I can't really explain things as well as some other people can, and so at times I'll quote people, um, and right now I'm going to show you uh, a video, probably one of the longest, uh, one of the couple minutes uh, videos that I've showed you. And this is a video of, or a chunk of a video of an interview uh, from Richard Feynman, who is probably one of the greatest American physicists to have lived. Um, and he was working during the time of the development of, uh, and development and refinement of quantum physics. Theoretical physicists, okay? So let's, okay, so before I hit play here, I just wanted, he's just say that he's giving an interview and the guy in the interview asks him a sort of fairly standard question that you might ask a physicist. And he, he asks something about uh, magnets. He says like, you know, when you have magnets, you try to put them together, they, uh, they push each other apart. And he goes, what, what is that? And uh, Feynman uh, kind of pokes, pokes him a little bit and tries to get him to clarify the question. Um, and gets onto this topic of what it is to ask a why question. So that's kind of the setup here. Uh, but the problem that you're asking, you see, when you ask why something happens, how does a person answer why something happens? For example, Aunt Minnie is in the hospital. Why? Because she slipped, she went out and she slipped on the ice and broke her hip. That satisfies it, people. It satisfies, but it wouldn't satisfy someone who came from another planet and knew nothing about things. First, you don't understand why, when you break your hip, do you go to the hospital? How do you get to the hospital with the, when the hip is broken? Well, because her husband, seeing that she had the hip was broken, called the hospital up and sent somebody to get her. All that is understood by people. Now, when you explain a, a why, you have to be in some framework that you allow something to be true. Otherwise, you're perpetually asking why. Why did the husband call up the hospital? Because husband is interested in his wife's welfare. Not always. Some husbands aren't interested in their wife's welfare when they're drunk and they're angry. And so you begin to get a very interesting understanding of the world and all its complications. In order to, to if you try to follow anything up, you go deeper and deeper in various directions. For example, you go, well, why did she slip on the ice? Well, ice is slippery. Everybody knows that. No problem. But you ask, why is ice slippery? That's kind of curious. Ice is extremely slippery. It's very interesting. You say, how does it work? You could, you see, so you could either say, I'm satisfied that you've answered me. Ice is slippery. That explains it. Or you could go on and say, why is ice slippery? And then you're involved with something because there aren't many things as slippery as ice. It's very hard to get greasy stuff, but that's sort of wet and slimy. But a solid that's so slippery? Because it is in the case of ice that when you stand on it, they say, momentarily the pressure melts the ice a little bit, so you got a sort of instantaneous water surface on which you're slipping. Why on ice and not on other things? Because ice expands when it, water expands when it freezes, so the pressure tries to undo the expansion and melts it. Is capable of melting it, but other substances crack when they're freezing, and when you push them, they're just as satisfied to be solid. Why does water expand when it freezes, and other substances don't expand when they freeze? All right, I'm, I'm not answering your question, but I'm telling you how difficult the why question is. You have to know what it is that you're permitted to understand and allow to be understood and known, and what it is you're not. 
You'll notice in this example that the more I ask why, it gets interesting after all. That's my idea that the deeper the thing is, the more interesting. Eh? And uh, we can even go further and say, why did she fall down when she slipped? That has to do with gravity. It involves in all the planets and everything else. Never mind. It goes on and on. And yeah, so it goes on and on. You can keep asking those why questions. Um, yeah. So if you haven't noticed, uh, Feynman is a person I greatly admire for one reason is, like I said, he's just a, he was a brilliant physicist and he did a lot of groundbreaking work. I'm sure he won at least one Nobel Prize. But um, even more so than that, uh, his outlook and his way of thinking or approaching uh, subjects, I just find fascinating. And so that for me encapsulates um, largely what I'm trying to get at where to say that uh, this driving force behind science is curiosity, right? You follow the, those questioning sort of wherever they lead and you find out some very interesting And so here you go. How about I leave you with a quote? The important thing is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has a reason for existing, has its own reason for existing. And that, of course, is Einstein riding a bike. All right, so that's it. Um, once again, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you learned something. And I really hope you're doing well in these crazy times. So, I wish I could have seen you all in class again. Um, definitely kind of sucks that it worked out this way, but we're all doing our best. So, keep on keeping on, and hopefully I'll see you around.